And this is Fermat's Last Theorem, as presented by Steve McKissick for History of Math at Texas A&M University, Central Texas. We start off with a problem that's very familiar. x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And this problem was known to the most ancient of cultures. The Babylonians and the Egyptians both used it for helping to measure various areas. Um, the ancient Greeks were very familiar with it. It's in Euclid's Elements. Uh, and it's even got its name, um, a familiar name to us, uh, from Pythagoras, an ancient Greek who lived um, about 580 to 500 BC. Uh, so we call this the Pythagorean theorem. What it looks like, and I'm not trying to simplify anything too much, but rather than taking anything for granted, Pythagorean theorem simply says that if I take a right triangle uh, with legs A and B and a hypotenuse C, that if I was to draw a square on each of those sides, that the squares that are drawn on the legs would add up to the square on the hypotenuse. So if A and B are both 3 and 4, and our hypotenuse is 5, then when I square 3 and 4, I should get 9 and 16, which adds up to 25. Now the Babylonians and the Egyptians computed tables and tables of these. Uh, below are just a follow or just a few of the um, Pythagorean triples that they've identified. And by Pythagorean triple, what I'm talking about is a whole number or an integer set of solutions for the problem. So we're not looking at fractions or decimals. We're simply concentrating on integer solutions. Now there are an infinite number of these. Uh, again, the Babylonians and Egyptians had some tables that stopped, but what if we took one of these, and we'll take this top equation with the 5, 12, and 13, and we multiplied each of those by 2? This resulting Pythagorean triple, we can add that to the list. And we can do that for an infinite number of multiples of each of those equations. So each, and we might call them a primitive triple, can lead to an infinite number of you know, Pythagorean triples. A gentleman by the name of Diophantus, um, around 250 AD, began working and cataloging a lot of form formulas and, and equations that were uh, familiar to the ancient Greeks. And among them um, was that problem, x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Now, Diophantus was really interested in algebraic equations that had integer coefficients to the variables and integer solutions when they're solved. Now, in, in his work, he never really presented any general methods on how to solve these. He simply gave specific answers for specific problems that were solved. And that frustrated um, quite a few people. There's a gentleman uh, in the Byzantine era by the name of John uh, Chortus Menes, who is known for quoting, uh, or writing a little note in his margin of Arithmetica saying, thy soul, Diophantus, be with Satan because of the difficulty of your theorems. Well, a, a guy by the name of Claude Bachet gets a hold of Arithmetica and translates it um, into Latin. It becomes a fairly popular translation, and Pierre de Fermat acquires a copy of it and starts making a lot of notes in the margins. Uh, some of them were just your, your normal uh, everyday margin notes uh, emphasizing one particular part of a problem or an aha moment. One of those notes, however, uh, we don't really know about it until after um, Fermat's son, Clement Samuel, republishes his dad's copy of Arithmetica with all of his margin notes in it. As it turns out, Fermat had actually sent a copy of uh, some of his margin notes some puzzles that he had created to a few people. He was known to torment some of the other mathematicians of his day by sending them fairly hard problems and claiming to have a solution, but forcing them to come up with one of their own. Um, Pierre de Fermat lived in the early 1600s, um, was a juror or a lawyer uh, by trade. Uh, he was an amateur mathematician, which in his mind meant that he didn't really have to put in as much time or effort as other mathematicians. Um, he, he did manage to spend quite a bit of time with math, though. Um, you would think that might have a conflict with his job, but apparently 
they were comfortable with him spending so much time with his math so that he didn't spend any time with the people that might end up in his court and therefore he could avoid some undue influence. Um, for Matt, studied algebra, number theory, probability, and even laid the foundations for some of calculus. Um, it's noted that he had regular writing relationships with uh, Blaise Pascal and Marin Marsin, uh, both of whom are very famous in their own rights for their contributions to math, including the work with number theory. Um, Marsin even lends his name to a set of prime numbers. Uh, Fermat is also known to have disputed with Descartes about his priorities. Uh, Descartes was not happy with uh, some of the puzzles that Fermat would, po would pose uh, without proof. As it turns out, Fermat was just not one who really liked the rigors of proof. Um, he didn't think that was the best use of his time. Well, the, the particular Martin note that I referenced earlier, Fermat noticed that x squared plus y squared equals z squared could be changed ever so slightly in replacing the, the 2 as the common exponent with n. And he started playing around with that a little bit and couldn't find an answer to any uh, of the new formulas that he created. And by that I mean he could not find an integer solution for x, y, and z if he changed the exponent to 3 or 4 or 5 or any other integer. What you see there is, is his Latin uh, margin note. Um, it is impossible to separate a cube into two cubes or fourth power into two fourth powers, or in general, any power higher than the second into two like powers. Now he goes on to say, I have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this, which, is, which this margin is too narrow to contain. Now, again, this is, this is a Fermat who is not a big fan of, of proof anyway. But to, but to be so blatant as to blame it on the size of his margin seems a little below him. But in any case, we never have found a copy of that proof. Um, his son Clement Samuel never found it, never published it. For Matt himself was not, not one to publish because then he would no longer be an amateur mathematician. Um, but he did actually prove that there would be no integer solutions if we change that exponent to a 4. And so when you see that terminology n equals 4, we're really talking about the exponent. And we're going to talk about those exponents a lot. Um, he used a method called infinite descent. And basically it's a, it's a proof by contradiction uh, that uses some, uh, uses some characteristics of the natural numbers, the way that they're sequenced to derive smaller and smaller equations and therefore derive a contradiction uh, in our first premise. But for whatever it's worth, he did prove that for n equals 4, there are no integer solutions to that particular um, problem. Now we're also going to start referencing that problem for Matt's last theorem as FLT. So if you see that come up on some of these future slides here, that's what we're talking about. Now he's, he's also he was also able to show us that with some exponents, like x to the 8th, uh, y to the 8th, and z to the 8th, to the 8th really means squared into the 4th, in whichever order we choose to look at it. But because of that, x squared to the 4th is really into the, or x to the 4th. It's, to, it's another specialized case, or generalized case, whichever way you want to look at it, of using n equals 4. Consequently, we don't need to worry about n equals 8 because we've already worried about n equals 4 and shown that it's impossible. So likewise, we could also get away with discarding n equals 12, n equals 16, and so on. Now, again, bear in mind that Fermat passed away in 1665. His son uh, put out his book um, probably around um, 1670, 1680. Leonard Euler comes along in the early 1700s and spends part of his time working with Fermat's last theorem. 
Uh, now, Euler contributed a lot to mathematics uh, that we'll see in just a little bit, um, only, more, only some of which is related to Fermat's last theorem. But Euler comes along and actually proves the case for n equals 3, so it kind of fills in a hole. We'd, we'd skip from 2 to 4 somehow, but Euler comes along and proves the case for n equals 3. Uh, two other gentlemen, um, and now we're getting into the 1800s, uh, Peter Dirichlet and uh, Monsieur uh, Legendre uh, prove the case for n equals 5. And they do it independent of each other, which is kind of nice. So we give them both credit for doing that. About 10 years after that, Gabriel Lamay uh, puts out a proof for n equals 7. Now, as it turns out, Lamay's proof was wrong. But it needed just a little bit of fixing, and that's why we credit Henri Lebesgue uh, with contributing to that proof, because he not only found, but also helped fix that particular error. Here's a little bit more about Leonard Euler. While he does prove the case for n equals 3, or at least provide a proof for n equals 3, one of his more uh, important contributions to solving uh, Fermat's last theorem is his development of the imaginary and complex number system. Uh, up until now, we had treated uh, negative radicals um, as useless, uh, as something to be discarded. Instead, Euler says those are important and they tell us something about the numbers. So we're going to hold on to them and see if we can use them in some useful way. Carl Gauss is the next big uh, mathematician on the scene. Gauss's name is written all over most math books. Uh, one of the important things that he did to start off with for Massa's theorem is he fixed Euler's proof. Euler actually had a little bit of a flaw in his proof uh, for n equals 3. We still give Euler credit for it. Gauss, was, Gauss is comfortable for being recognized for fixing that, that error. Now, he also expanded on Euler quite a bit, um, not only taking complex numbers, but developing a complex plane. Uh, so we now can graph our complex numbers. Uh, analytic functions um, became a passion for Gauss. Um, how can we manipulate an x-y equation? Uh, if, I, if I change one parameter of it, how does that change the entire uh, function? And it does become the basis for modular forms, which plays heavily into our solution for Fermat's last theorem. Of particular importance is this last note. Gauss converted or found a way to convert Diophantine equations, and remember that those are simply xy equations with integer coefficients and integer solutions. He converted those into elliptic curves. So he was able to, uh, to make some good translations of those equations.